Amen? Amen. Amen. God is good all the time. Well, if you don't know me, I am Lee Brewer. Just want to see how many of you knew me. Also, wanted to set that up and leave a little pause there because we are in an I Am series. And so Jesus is telling us who he is, and he starts out with I Am and seven times in the book of John, and we're on the second I Am this week. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 10. I hope you have your Bibles. I always say if you want to hear a word from God, you got to go to the word of God. So remember that. If you want to hear a word from God, go to the word of God. So John chapter 10 is where we're going to be this morning. And I am the door, or yours may say, I am the gate. And I'll probably throw those two words around equally, door or gate, depending on how funny my illustration is. But the door or the gate, it means the same thing. Jesus says, I am the door. So let's read in John chapter 10. We're going to read the first 10 verses. I love to hear pages turning in your, in your Bible because it means you've got it and it means you're waiting and you're ready to hear something that God's, God's about to tell you. So here we go. Verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name. And leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand it, that that he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. Father God, this morning as we open your word and we learn the truths you'd have to teach us, Father God, just let me be transparent so that your word can be clearly evident. Father God, we ask you bless this time according to your truth. In your name I pray. Amen. A couple of questions for you real quick. So you're going to have to think for just a moment. How many doors are in your home? How about exterior doors? Think about that. How many exterior doors do you have at your home? Okay. You got that? How many interior doors do you have in your home? Now, let's, let's clarify, clarify a door. Exterior doors help you go in and out of the outside of your house, interior doors. So I was adding this up yesterday. I was starting to go, okay, well, I have four doors on the outside of my house. I uh, started adding up the doors inside. And I'm like, okay, went through the bedroom doors. And then, okay, closets have doors. And, and bathrooms have doors. And I'm like, okay, so I have about 14 doors inside my house. And then I got to thinking, well, there's other doors in my house, like uh, the, the refrigerator door. And then you got an oven, and you got a convection oven, and then you got a microwave, and then you, you've got, um, you got a shower, I got a couple of shower doors. Uh, and then, then I started looking around going, well, do I count the cabinet doors? So I counted my cabinet doors, and then, I, and then I'm like, well, the bathrooms have vanities, so I counted the bathroom, and then I'm like, well, I have a little walk-in clo- a little closet, and then it's got like a little small door, you know, like Willy Wonka type of door, you know, where it's like a big door and a small door, and it just gets smaller and smaller back into a closet. So I went and counted all those doors, and then I got a door to the attic, and inside the attic I got a door, and I'm like, man, I got a lot of doors in this house. And then, you know, I, maybe like some of you, I'm like, man, I just don't have enough storage space. And I'm going, man, where are all these doors coming from? I have 50 doors in my house, counting all the cabinets and whatever, 50 doors. So I was up here yesterday, and I was, I was standing right here praying for today, praying for you, praying that I don't mess this thing up this morning. 
And I just got to look and going, well, there's a bunch of doors in here. You start noticing these things, right? And so I started, I started counting the sanctuary doors. You know how many doors are in the sanctuary? Never thought about it, have you? You come in here probably weekly. Some of you have been here for a long time, coming week after week after week. Well, I wrote them down here. Um, how many doors there are in here? Okay, in this sanctuary total, 24 doors. Which, in my mind, all of a sudden now I go, well, I wonder how many doors are in the whole church. <laughs> I, only spent, I only spent about a half an hour trying to count them. <laughs> until I stopped in the 150s. So there are, I know in this church there are at least 150 doors, and I bet I'm way off. And I didn't count cabinets and refrigerators. And fr I just counted actual walk-through doors. There's at least 150 doors in this whole church. You know, and I, I just got to think, sometimes we take doors for granted. Sometimes a door needs to be appreciated. Now, if you came to my house, you know, my, my front door, it's a, you know, it's a solid color, solid metal door. There's no, I don't have a fancy window in front of my front door or anything like that. And, but I've seen some other people's houses, and you walk up, and they have nice front doors. And I, and I, love, a good front, I love a good porch. I, I was raised in the South, okay? I love a good porch. And so the, the, a nice front door is something that's very nice. You walk up to a house, you're like, wow, that's a nice door. Sometimes a door needs to be appreciated. And then sometimes it's just a common door. Well, being the, the, the type of pastor that I am, I kind of spin everything to the spiritual side and go, ah, oh, but there's only one door, and that's Jesus. And then I got to thinking how people in our lives, they'll, they'll say, oh, there's so many ways to get to heaven. There's so many options of the spiritual life. If you just find inner peace, you'll find happiness. Or you have even Christian preachers saying that God only is concerned about your happiness. That's his number one thing is your happiness. And, uh, and, and all these doors are being offered in our life. So what is the truth? Well, this morning Jesus says, I am the door. Now, I love the, the I am statements of Jesus all the, going all the way back to Exodus where Moses goes to the bush and, and God's like, no, go get my people out of Egypt. And Moses is like, well, when they ask, I mean, who am I supposed to say sent me, a burning bush? He goes, you tell them, I am sent you. And the, the wording for I am is so heavy that Moses didn't go, that doesn't make sense, God. Who sent you? I am. That doesn't make any sense to us. But in God terms, it's the heaviest name, the heaviest phrase, the heaviest title you could have presented before anyone. I am. And people say, oh, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, hey, John chapter 4, Jesus walks up and there's a woman at the well. Maybe you're familiar with the story. And he starts talking to this woman at the well. And, and they start this conversation about getting water. And he's like, I'm, if, you know, if you drank from the water I had, you'd never thirst again. And she's like, I want that because I'm tired of coming to the well. And so Jesus says, well, I... I know all about you, and I hear some things about you. And she goes, whoa, I see that you're a prophet, so answer me this. They say we have to worship over there. Your people say we have to worship over there. Who's right? And Jesus says, well, it's not going to matter. There's a time coming where it doesn't matter where you are to worship God. And the woman said, well, I know that the Messiah is coming. I know one day the Messiah is going to come. He's going to explain all of this to us. And then there it is. I think Jesus kind of leans in and kind of half smiles and goes, kind of this Messiah you're talking about? He says, the one who speaks to you, I am. Now, your Bible won't say that. Uh, it will. Now, here's, here's, the, here's the funny part about that passage in our English. When you read it in John chapter 4, it's, Jesus, it's, the translation is, I am he. Because that's kind of the nuance, that's kind of what it's trying to say there. I am he. Look in John chapter 4 real quick and then we'll move. This is not even our main thing, I'm just kind of off on a tangent. But now that I'm here, we've got to do it, right? Look in verse 26. Jesus said to her, okay, it's chapter 4, verse 26. Jesus said to her, 
I who speak to you am he. It's the same wording as when Jesus comes up and says, I am. I just want to like go, just, just say I am. Jesus right there is declaring. And you know what she did? She came to draw water and she has the water and she just puts it down and goes back into town. When he goes, I am, I think she just stepped back and she was like, wow, it's him. And she went into town and it says many believe because of her testimony. Jesus says, I am. Well, here in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the door. Now, I, I want to go ahead and explain this. I almost waited to the end because this, this explanation is kind of that, can I give you the climax here at the beginning and then we feed off of that? Is, okay? okay, I know, it's, you know you watch a movie and it sets up the characters and all of a sudden they have, you know, you have to know who they are and what they're trying to accomplish and then all of a sudden, you know, almost to the end is the climax and you see them, he's running across the beach and she's running across the beach into each other's arms and it's love and you're like, oh, it's so sweet and you're crying and then my wife elbows me and stop crying, okay? <laughs> you know, and it's the, it's the height of the movie and it's emotional. Well, let me go ahead and give you that now and then let's talk about it for the rest of the time, okay? Because, by the way, the climax is Jesus died on the cross but he was raised three days later for salvation, okay? So you already, you already know the climax, right? Okay. Good, so we've already got that so let me just give you this one up front here. Jesus says, I am the gate of the sheep. I am the door for the sheep. What happens is in, in their days, they would have this corral area, and they would bring their sheep in, and they'd keep them in the pen, and there would be a small opening. The shepherd would sit or lay in that opening. The shepherd was the gate. The shepherd was the door. And we're going to see all, all the different reasons for that, but I want to go ahead and give you that, that the shepherd is the door. So when, when Pastor Joey asked me to preach on I am the door, I'm like, I don't know how to preach just I am the door without preaching I am the shepherd because they are one. How do I preach God without preaching Jesus? You can't because they're one. I am the door. I am the gate. So I want you to have that picture, that, that image that, that the shepherd is sitting in the opening with sheep on one side and everything else on the other. Look at John chapter 10 one more time. Verse 1. John chapter 10, verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Now, the, the first thing you need to know is that the door leads to exclusion. If you're a notes person, I got three points and three subpoints. I'm very simple in that way. Very old fashioned in my strategy. Three points. I don't do poems though. Is that okay? Okay. So I got three points. First, the door leads to exclusion. Now, you've got a door at your house or wherever you stay, you've got a door. It's for exclusion, right? You know, there are people walking up to your house and you don't want to answer the door sometimes. You thought of Jehovah Witnesses, didn't you? You, you shouldn't. Mm, you, you laugh because you know you did. Or a door-to-door -door salesman. Let's just not pick on anybody here, okay? So all of a sudden, you see somebody walking up, and you look through the window, and you're like, ooh. And then you pick up the dog. It's like, honey, get in the back. Pretend we're not here. You've done that. The door is for exclusion. They knock on the door. They ring the doorbell. The dog goes crazy. You're like, they'll go away. And you just kind of sit there and don't answer. Doors for exclusion. Now my garage, it's funny, I used to have a car in the garage. Then I had a kid, now he's got a little car in the garage. And a cart and jogging stroller and just toys. And so we're like, well, you know what, we can't park a car in here, so let's move some furniture in there. And, you know, and all of a sudden now my garage is not a place for cars, it's a place for stuff. I have a garage door so that you can't see all that stuff. It's excluding you from being able to see into my garage in which I still had my neighbor's leaf blower. Uh, so he called me yesterday. I need my leaf blower. I'm like, oh, yeah. It's in the garage. <laughs> and so 
Doors are for exclusion. Now, the shepherd sits as the gate to keep out evil. Now, Jesus constantly refers to the Pharisees as a pit of vipers or wolves. I mean, false teachers or wolves in sheep's clothing. He, he says that there are dangers, and he sits in the entrance at the gate as the gate to keep out the evil. Jesus protects us, not, not necessarily just from all the physical effects of sin and not just from sin's effects, but the spiritual war that rages. Jesus is our protector. Verse 1 says that anyone else who tries to get in other than the gate is a thief and a robber. Anyone else who claims to be able to get to heaven other than by the name of Jesus is a thief and a robber. Because Jesus says there's only one way to salvation, there's only one way to heaven, there's only one way to truth, there's only one way to eternal life, and that's through him. There's only one way to safety in the corral, and that's through the shepherd. You don't get into the corral properly except coming through the gate. And Jesus says, so that you understand this, I am the gate. Now, I don't know about, about you, specifically men maybe here. If you have a wife and the bed's there, I sleep on the closest side of the door, always. Partially, I think it's just a natural tendency, and partially, if you're going to get to her, you're going to go through me. For my family, if you're breaking in my house, if you're a thief and a robber, you're going to have to go through me to get to my family. That's just how it is. And I'm ready, and I've accepted that, and I want that responsibility. And I really believe Jesus sits at the gate, and he goes, hey, you want to get to these people? You've got to come through me. You want to get to heaven? You've got to come through me. All you liars and thieves and robbers spiritually, and you're out to get people? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Can't happen. These are my sheep. Yes. And I love this because uh, before here recently, I didn't even think about this passage. I always thought about him being the door, being salvation into heaven. I never thought about it being salvation security. The once saved, always saved notion. If you can work your way into heaven, you can work your way out of heaven. That's not true. Because the Bible says you can't work your way into heaven. There's nothing you can do except, except Jesus because he's the one who can only do it for you. Amen. There it is. He is the gate. You come through Jesus. Sheep can't be good enough to get into the pen. Think about sheep. They're dumb. They can see about six feet in front of them. That's it. They are a defenseless creature. Growing up, I, I, I rode horses and I lived lived around cows and horses and stuff, and I actually did a few rodeos, little junior rodeos when I was a kid, and the little kids, they, they didn't ride the bulls, they rode the sheep. How long can you stay on a sheep? And sheep aren't crazy, they're just scared all the time. And so you put a little kid on the back of a sheep, and he's, I mean, you don't even need a rope, you just hang on, like just get a handful. And the little kid's just, you know, just laying down on the sheep, and they're like, all right, go, boom. And you hit that sheep one time, and he goes crazy. Whoa! And it just takes off. And see how long you can say, because the sheep darts back and forth. Well, you try to corral all those sheep. The first thing they do is they see another sheep, and they gravitate towards the sheep. Until all the sheep are in a group, and then you move the sheep as a group. And you don't pick out, okay, you're a good sheep, you're a bad sheep. You just say, okay, all the sheep come. And then you lead them to where you want them to go. You can't be good enough or bad enough to affect your salvation. Because that's not the basis of it anyway. Jesus is the way to salvation. And if he's the way to salvation, he's the security for your salvation. So the door is for exclusion. Number two, the door leads to inclusion. Now, I, I, I was reading the other day uh, in, in London, England, one of the most famous doors in all the world is number 10 Downing Street. 
Do you know what number 10 Downing Street is? It's where the English Prime Minister and pretty much everybody else over there in England does all their political business. It rivals the White House as probably the most important building in the world. And number 10 Downing Street is just a black door with a number 10 in guards. But I found something very interesting about the door. It only opens from the inside. Which means when you come to the door, no matter who it is, even the prime minister, when they come to the door, they don't have a key to unlock the door because there is no keyhole. It is a door with a knocker. And they knock and someone lets them in. It only opens from the inside. Folks, salvation is not, well, let me, let me see if I can find the right key in life. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can you, know, you know, pick the lock with a credit card. Uh, let, me, let me see if I can't just give my little shoulder into it and pop this thing open. Mm -mm. Salvation is coming and asking, may I come in? And Jesus is clear in Scripture. Those that call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus, knock, 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 knock. Can I come in? Knock, knock. If he is the gate, he is the door, and you're knocking saying, Jesus, I want to be a part of your family. I want to be a part of the group. I want to be with you, Christ. I think Jesus goes, come on in. The door is for inclusion. Now, there, there's some, some people that, you know, they, they, they kind of do the little, okay, I guess I'll knock, but then they open the door and just walk right in your house, and you're fine with that. You might have some people knock on the door, come in right in, and you're like, Psh, I really wish you'd wait. <laughs> and then, you know, you go to somebody's house and you knock and you wait for them to come and open the door, right? I mean, this is our social behavior for knocking on doors, right? Well, the door is for inclusion. They knock, they ring the doorbell, I open, see who it is, close it if I don't like it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the door is for exclusion. And inclusion. It's a very basic, simple thing, right? Whether you have a really cheap door, a real expensive door, whether it's a fancy door or not, whether it's a refrigerator door, your washer, dryer, everything is for in and out. It's the same basic principle. We have a door to go in and to go out. Everything else is details. And Jesus says, everything is about in and out. In my family, or keep them out. So you have inclusion, you have exclusion, and then the door leads to desired places. Now, I don't, I don't normally, <laughs> I don't know if I've ever just looked at my bathroom door and said, I just want to walk through that door. And then I walk into the bathroom and I'm like, that was nice, I think I'm going to walk out again. I mean, do we do, no, who does that, right? You know, we don't, we don't normally just walk into a room and stand there and go, oh, okay, that was nice, and then walk out, unless you forgot what you were going in there for, right? And then don't use the bathroom illustration for that, right? <laughs> and so you walk in to a door because you're going somewhere. It's purpose. You walked in one of these doors because this is where you wanted to come. Well, let's look at verses um, 9 and 10. Chapter 10, verse 9. I am the door. If anyone enters me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Psalms 23 talks about the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me, right? And where? It's so still waters. And where? Green pastures. If Jesus is the gate, if he is sitting as the door, and we come through him for salvation, and then he leads us somewhere, it's going to be a place of desire. Somewhere we want to be. And I tell you, sheep want to be with the shepherd. If the shepherd walks away, 
the sheep want to come to. The sheep don't always know where the shepherd's going, but they just know that I need to be with the shepherd. That's got to be our hearts as the sheep, as followers of Christ. If Jesus is going to let me in, I'm going to worship him and be thankful for my salvation. And if he lets me out, I know that he has plans to prosper me and not to harm me. You see, it's the thief and it's the robbers, it's the, it's the devil, it's the evil spiritual side that wants to get to us, not Christ. So why does bad things happen to me, even if I'm a Christian? It's not because God's going, hey, let me, let me, let me do something bad to these people. No, 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 no. It's the, there's a war, it's a spiritual battle going on, and God's like, no, I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. That's the other side. I am the shepherd. I am the gate. I am the door of life. Anyone who enters me will be saved. And then you can go in and out. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have a 19-month-old son, LJ, and... um, we were sitting down, and, and I, I put in Narnia, the, the movie Narnia. You may have read the, the Chronicles of Narnia books by C.S. Lewis. And I, I just thought maybe he'd like the lions and stuff, and of course he did, because uh, he's into that making animal noise stage now, right? So every time a horse comes by, it's... That's a pretty good horse noise, I guess. So I'm like, good job, buddy. So we, we put in the Chronicles, Chronicles of Narnia, and... and started watching it, and I was thinking, wow, this is a really cool scene. I was going to show it, but it's really boring. It's where they're going to play hide and go seek, and, and so she goes, and the little girl looks in a room, and she sees this wardrobe that she's told not to mess with. Well, she goes, and she, curiosity gets the best of her, so she pulls the sheet off the wardrobe, and she opens the door and just looks inside. And then she hears her brother counting, and he's almost finished counting, and she realizes, I've got to find a place to hide. So she ducks into the wardrobe, closes the door, and starts walking, kind of just walking backwards, feeling for the back of the wardrobe to hide behind the, the coats. Well, when she gets to the last coat, she puts her hand back, and is kind of pricked by something, and she turns and looks, and there's a pine tree with some needles. And when she turns and looks, she sees this winter wonderland scene with a little oil lamp with a small flame and she's in a whole new world. And it takes her a while to convince her brothers that there is this other world and you have to enter through this door, the wardrobe. But soon they come to realize that through this door is a whole nother life. Where they're not just regular paupers running from a war. They are actually kings and queens of Narnia. I believe that C.S. Lewis wrote all of that with the comparison that Jesus is the door. And you are not some pauper who's fighting this war alone in life. Instead, you are children of the king. When Jesus is the door, when he is the entrance, and you come into his family, he's not just adopting you because, oh, I have pity on you, let me just give you a better life. No, Jesus is saying, you will become princes, princesses. You are my children. Come into my family. I am not the ones who are, I'm not the one who is out there to get you. I have the, am the one who came to give you life and life more abundant. Would we take Jesus at his word? Would we believe that God is love? Not just that he shows love, not that he could have some love, but that God is love. Growing up, I, I, I loved game shows. What do you mean, growing up? I still love game shows. And there was one that, that I, I, a couple that I watched every morning in the summer when I stayed with my grandmother. And one was um, The Price is Right. Yeah, it's a good one, it's a classic. And then the other one was Let's Make a Deal. 
Okay, y'all have seen that? Okay. They have what? Three doors. And they always dress in weird costumes, but beside the point. They had three doors, and then you could take door number one, door number two, or door number three. And you never knew what you were going to get. You could settle for the can of beans, or you could try for the next door, which might have a lot of money or cars. I, who knows what might be behind that door. I am so glad that, that one day when I stand before Jesus, he doesn't sit me down and all of a sudden some music starts playing. He grabs a microphone and goes, Lee Brewer, let's make a deal. You can choose door number one, two, or three. Choose wisely. I don't know. And then I'll turn to you guys. What should I do? What should I do? You know, Door number one. I'll take door number one. I am sorry, Lee. That's the one-way ticket to hell. I'm so sorry. Wait, I didn't. I'll take door number two. Never mind. I am so glad that Jesus isn't playing games like that. I'm so glad that Jesus goes, look, Verse 6, I mean, you can see verse 6, he's talking to the Pharisees, and, and they're like, he says, they didn't understand what he was trying to tell them, so he goes, let me start at the very basic and beginning. I am the door. I'm so glad that sometimes when I don't understand, Jesus goes, okay, time out, let me, let me just say that I, I, I am the only way to heaven. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, you might be saved. No, no, not, not might, right? Not, let's see, could be, not, not could What's the word I'm looking for? Will be saved. Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart, he was raised from the dead, you will be saved. That is good news. This morning, let's make a deal. Jesus has already told you he is the way to salvation. And for many of us in this room, I imagine that we've accepted that. You know Jesus. Jesus. Typical church crowd, many know Jesus. But I believe many are also suffering and hurting and confused and feeling alone. And Jesus says, you know what? I'm still the gate. I'm still the door. You're still part of this family and I still care because I'm still the shepherd. So when you feel alone, you're like, God, are you there? Jesus responds, I am. When he says, Jesus, is this thing real? Are you real? I am. Will you help me through this difficult Thanksgiving and Christmas without someone that I love? Will you be here to help me through this, through the whole thing? And Jesus says, I am. Jesus isn't going anywhere. But he's inviting us to come to him continually over and over again. That's why Jesus said, I'd leave the 99 to go find the one. I'm so glad that Jesus came and found me. Amen. Let's make a deal. Will you take Jesus at his word? Even when you don't understand it all and you're confused and hurting and alone, will you just embrace Jesus? If you've never been saved this morning, will you accept the truth that Jesus is the only way to heaven? Jesus is salvation and the only way to be saved to be forgiven and to embrace Jesus. Let's make a deal. Father God, I pray <clears throat> that you are completely glorified with everyone in here to the fullness of your glory and that we will shed the, the sin in our life and the things that hinder us and we will run to you and run to the cross and embrace you as Lord and Savior and as shepherd and as the gate. Because where you lead, I will follow. So Jesus, in this time, do a work in our hearts. I give you the glory. In your name I pray. Amen.